would like to take the opportunity to introduce Professor Jagannath Rao for our second keynote session of the day. Dr. Jagannath Rao is a professor of practice, School of Electrical and Computer Engineering, University of Georgia, USA. Thank you, Neha. Uh, uh, and the topic is Advancement in Research Fueling Industry 4.0. And I believe the day started with, with a keynote on, on research drives innovation. And that is where I want to start and give a different perspective. And my perspective is that research does not necessarily drive innovation. Now that might sound very contradictory and conflicting, but let me, let me explain that further. Because I would also argue that there is no innovation without research. And these two might come across as very conflicting statements. But let's, let's take a look at what's been happening uh, in the world to, to try to understand what does research really do uh, for us. So if, if you look, if you go back 100 years, you know, there was in, in 1915, Einstein gave a series of lectures on some of the most groundbreaking research that he was working upon at that point of time, right? And the topics that he covered in, that, in those lectures were the quantum theory of light, the theory of special relativity, uh, and the equation, explaining the equation E is equal to mg squared, 100 years ago. Now, more than 75 years later after his research, it led to some very groundbreaking innovations. One of them is GPS, something that we cannot live without today, uh, based on the satellite navigation system, TV, things that we're addicted to, the cathode ray tube and the technology that goes into that. And of course, some innovations we don't like, but they're out there, speeding tickets, a radar gun. So these are all innovations that were driven out of the research that was done almost 100 years back. Now, certainly Einstein did not do the research keeping all these innovations in mind, right? So therefore, I, I would conclude that research is the enab enabler of innovation, right? You can have research and if nobody does anything with it, there is no innovation. Every time we come across, uh, you know, when Apple or one of those or the Teslas of the world come up with some absolutely fantastic product, we say, oh, that was a great idea and it's disrupting the industry. Well, it was more than an idea. It's built upon something that they have been looking at in over time something that they have worked based on all the different kinds of research that's been going on, not just in that space, but anything that can touch that space. So therefore I would conclude that research is the enabler of innovation. Now, keeping that in mind, let's see how we can apply some of these concepts to, to Industry 4.0, right? So Industry 4.0, what I'm going to talk about here is let's look at some of the enablers of research in industry 4.0 and then how that might lead to innovations. And I'm going to take some examples here and I'm going to stick to one or two topics given the time. But you can extend this idea to so many different things. But let's start with the understanding of what is industry 4.0? What's the premise of industry 4.0? And the premise is that cyber physical systems have all information available at every stage of their life cycle. That means all connected systems, whether you're in a design phase, whether you're in a manufacturing phase, or whether it is in an operational phase in the field, that information form of data is available at every stage of their life cycle for every one of these systems. That's the fundamental premise of industry 4.0. There's one difference between 3.0 and 4.0, it would be this. If I translate that premise, what that means is, if you have a physical product, you have a digital model of that. Whether it was a design stage or whether it's an operational stage. I can further say that physical product plus production facility plus a digital model of all this. You can even translate it to say it's a physical product plus the production facility, plus the field operations of these systems, plus the digital model of all these. So that is the fundamental way you have to understand industry 4.0. Having said that, let's look at some of the, the, the research 
uh, enablers in this area. Uh, number one, and, and there are many, I won't be touching upon many, but I'm going to, I picked a couple of them, which I think are really uh, out there and making a big difference. So enable number one, all the advances in machine learning and computer vision. These two areas, the amount of research that's been going on, the amount of papers that get published, the amount of activity around the world is tremendous. While the field of machine learning is as old as maybe 50, 60 years old, but the advances that have happened over the last 10, 15 years have been dramatic. Now, not all of these advances, not all of this research in these areas of machine learning and computer vision is being done, keeping in mind that certain innovations have to happen. These are activities that are going on in a very discreet manner. But what can I do in terms of innovation based on the research going on in those areas? How can I help you know, the industry that we are in manufacturing? So let's think about it. Now, by definition, Industry 4.0 uh, implementations and cyber physical systems, they are what I would call data generators. And, that, and because they are data generators, they can lead to innovations like a simple thing like knowing your asset. Now, while we do many things using these technologies in, in the industry, uh, especially in manufacturing, and we talk about predictive analytics and we talk about advanced things, one of the most fundamental things you can do is know your asset. And when I'm talking about knowing your asset, I'm talking about having a deeper insight into your asset as it operates, right? So that's one of the areas. The other areas is these, these technologies are leading to all kinds of applications which can improve the performance of your asset. And so if you're a product developer and you are interested in making sure that your uh, asset has the best performance, these technologies have all kinds of applications that build on that. Increasing the yield of your asset. Can I make my asset more intelligent? Can I make it work at very optimal uh, operating points? How can I make that on a, on a continuous basis? That's, those are some of the other areas of innovation. Driving new business models. Now, all these things, when you have so much insight into what's going on with your operations, when you, are, when you have an understanding of how it is performing on a continuous basis across this life, life cycle, you can develop innovative ideas to drive new business models. And one of the areas which I, I really find very interesting is selling outcomes. Just to give you an example is, you know, I, I was doing some work with, with a company in the US which made compressors. And, and I'm talking about five years ago. And they had an interest in developing what they call connected compressors so that wherever in the field their compressors are installed, they could get data from it, look what it's doing in its operation and, and, and be able to make sure that it is, it is working in a reliable and performant manner. But what that drove is that drove them to thought about, look, the customers who are buying these compressors are not necessarily buying a compressor. What they really need is compressed air. That's what they need in their operations. Uh, now, but they have to buy a compressor. They have to install it. They have to maintain it. Uh, that's the necessary evil that goes with uh, when you need compressed air. So the business model that these, this company was coming up with is, hey, what about I sell you compressed air instead of a compressor? And that is exactly what I mean by selling outcomes. And these technologies with what they can do with your assets can also drive or enable these new business models, which is part of innovation. Generation of new revenue streams, uh, new services. Uh, there was a company I worked with, uh, they used to make, it was an automotive industry ancillary and they used to make these, these honing machines, machines which are, make sure that the grinding on the engine case is perfect and the quality is perfect and there are holes that are drilled for pistons and things like that. And one of the problems with those machines was the head, which would do all that, would wear out. And, and like anything else, they would, when they sold the machines, they would say, hey, every 600 hours of operation, you have to change that head. And there was no reason or rhyme for why to 600 hours. It was simply based on experience. It's a bit like when you buy a car and it says every 5,000 miles, please change the oil. You don't know why. Why not 2,000? Why not 3,000 miles? So what this company did is say, now that I have a connected honing machine, how about I read continuously the data and find out what's going on with that head in terms of wear and tear 
And now I'm able to sell a service to the customer, which says, I let you know whether you know, your head is still good, even though 600 hours have passed and you can use it maybe for another 100 hours. Or the other way around, hey, it's 200 hours and the way you've used it, it looks like something is wrong here. You have to change the head because otherwise it has a direct impact on the quality of what you're producing and therefore wastage. So that's, that's, a, that's an example of generating new revenue streams. Um, if you are in the business where you're manufacturing product which have to be packaged and packaging is such an important element of this whole process, so inspection systems for these, uh, reducing recalls, therefore, uh, is a very important aspect. And finally, but most importantly, how can I enhance the customer experience using these technologies uh, and making it possible to, to give the best experience for customers? So these are the areas I would say you can think about. Now, this all comes out of the research that was done in the areas of machine learning, in the areas of computer vision, and how do you translate that into something that is being applied, right? So let me give you two examples. Now, some of the examples you might say that, hey, these are large companies or these have companies have the, the, you know, the, the, cl the, the cloud, the financial cloud to do something like this. But the point I want you to take away here is the ideas that are generated out of some of these technologies and how innovation was done. And you can do it whether you're a small business or a big business. So here in the pharma world, inspection and quality control. Technology was used, the advanced machine learning and computer vision technologies. Well, deep learning was used to identify and verify tablet count. As it's going on its packaging machines, uh, you, can, you can identify and verify uh, tablet counts. Then they use computer vision to look at the dimensions of these tablets because that determined whether the tablet uh, in terms of not just the drug quality, but also the quality of uh, every tablet being equal, uh, being verified. They could, they had the possibility of having this 360 degrees verification of bottling and packaging. What did all this lead to? All this led to avoiding shipping defective drugs. And in the, in the area of drugs and, and the regulations that are there, it is such a critical thing because it leads to a massive recall process and a massive loss in terms of your operational costs and your and wastages. So that's that's one example of how this was translated into innovation. The other area is products and components. If you are a product or a component manufacturer, an area that really has caught on is something called regenerative design. Uh, what is regenerative design? This comes from the use of, again, in the areas of deep learning, where research has now been going on for the last couple of years in a specific uh, uh, technology called generative adversarial neural networks, which can produce many designs for, if you have a product that you have in mind and you're going through a design process, it can generate a variety of designs for you. And the picture on the right should give you an idea of what that, that looks like. Now, what is interesting about this is, that once you have, once you give the data about the weight, the size, the material you're using, what are some of the manufacturing conditions under this, this product will be made? What are some of the operating conditions under which this product will, will operate? It helps you pick some of the best designs. You can come up with unique designs if there are constraints and you can, you can feed in the constraints and you can come up with, based on constraint-based scenarios, unique designs. Now, again, if you look at GANs as they are called and the evolution of GANs and how the research in that area went about, there was no, there was no thought even that it would be used for something like this. But the way this innovate, this, this research was translated in technological use gives you an idea as to why I keep saying research is an enabler, but you still have to take it and do something innovative with that. Second area of innovation or, or second research enabler, I would say, is this whole thing that is capturing the, the world uh, in terms of digital twins and simulation, right? Let's try to understand first, what is a digital twin? Well, in its simplest uh, explanation, what it is, is it's a virtual representation of a physical product or process. That means if I have, if I'm developing a process and I'm using, for example, CAD, tools to design the product. I can go one step further. I can build in the functionality by looking at the physics and math of that. I can build 
models and simulate them using simulation software in such a way that even without building a single physical prototype, I have a design of a product with all its functional elements. I'm able to simulate it and then see if it works well, tweak the design and keep doing those iterations till I come up with a perfect design for what I want for the product without driving a single screw anywhere in the real world. And then seamlessly trans, uh, you know, transferring that into manufacturing and usage, right? So that's the concept of, of digital twin. And one of the, let me say, uh, key values of industry 4.0. So you can have a digital twin of a product. If you're a manufacturer, for example, of a, of a bottle or a container like that for looks like ketchup. On the right side of that, you see the picture of what the digital twin will be. And it's not just a physical representation in terms of a CAD drawing, but it's got all the functionality built in. Now, if you want to manufacture this product and you need a, a manufacturing line, you can also design and create a digital twin of production to see how this digital twin of the product flows through the manufacturing process so that you get a good manufactured product on the other side. So you can also make that. So, so far, everything I've described here, you are still very much in the virtual world, right? And you can then seamlessly transfer this into the real world where you make these and it goes to the field. So that is the digital twin. Now, digital twins and the way they were developed and the research that goes into it, and then the other areas of research which were used while doing this research is again, something that we never expected it to end up in all the different innovations that we see today. So let's look at some of the areas of innovation. One is with the digital twin, now you have the possibilities of evaluating whatever your product or system is on a continuous basis. That means not just during design, but right through its life cycle. You get a live window, a view into the product throughout its life cycle. One of the biggest innovations is that. The other one is because of the way you're developing and designing products and manufacturing systems, the speed of innovation, which I believe is a very critical thing if you want to really capitalize on what you're doing, uh, faster, cheaper, fully simulated prototypes, speed to market, all this plays a role uh, using these technologies. You can simplify very complex systems the minute you're able to build digital twins. If you look at the city of Singapore, uh, which is considered to be a smart city, they have a complete digital representation of their whole city and the utilities and the system that goes into it. And that puts you in a very different level of uh, how you run your cities, how you run your systems. Uh, at the same time, how are you able to simplify complex system? Digital twin is playing a big role today also in uh, creating the twins of complete smart supply uh, chain systems. So again, an area of innovation, which was never something that was foreseen. Collaborative twins. Now, if you have two digital twin models, I mean, for example, if you have two robots uh, and two digital twins of robots, now you're reaching a point where you can also start testing in a, in a virtual world, the collaboration with these twins because manufacturing lines, assembly lines are going into areas where robots and other systems are collaborating with each other to get a task done. So collaborative twins is the other area which is really being propelled thanks to the concept of digital twins. Of course, the, what this is going to lead to is autonomous manufacturing with the industrial internet of thing as the foundational piece, along with what we call self-organizing systems as foundational pieces. I'll give a little example of this a little later on, uh, but these are some of the areas that we've got, that innovation, that, tech, that research has been translated into innovation in, in industry. And I'll, I'll give a couple of examples. Let's take Tesla. And let's take this concept of continuous evaluation. Tesla has a digital twin of every car. Every car that goes out of its factory, there's a digital twin. Now, these, these cars, when they're running on the road, they're connected to these digital twins, connected back to these through, through all the different uh, connections built into Tesla. And so the car is continuously sending data to its digital twin, right? So the digital twin is now able to look at the data, see what performance it expected when it was designed and what it's doing while it is in operation. Anomalies are corrected. And the minute they see some very, very clear anomalies which need to be corrected, the next thing you know is you get a software download in your car which corrects that. 
The self-driving design, because there are hundreds and thousands of drivers using self-driving capabilities of this car, they're getting feedback on not just the driver's experience, but how the car is behaving in that mode. And that is then continuously being updated. The self-driving design, the software, the technology behind that is being continuously updated based on this feedback. So you see, this is what we mean by, and this can be done for any product. It's not just Tesla, but this is what we mean by continuous evaluation. Another company which has really used this technology is, is Bridgestone for what they call tire management. They developed digital twin of tires to improve their uh, tire life. And they used it now as an R&D tool. And they would have sensors feeding real lifelike data to this twin and then see how those tires behave, what the wear and tear looks like. They improved the designs, they shortened they could shorten the design cycles. They could launch new varieties of tires. Therefore, speed to market was something they really banked on. But they also are getting to the next level. They are beginning to, just like we are used in the IT world as infrastructure as a service or software as a service, something called tire as a service offerings. And this is what I mean by new business models. Also, they're looking at more innovative ideas like price per kilometer. That means, can I, instead of buying tires, can I buy uh, you know, the kilometers it runs upon and, and, and a subscription based on that? And this is great for companies which own fleets of these vehicles and are in, in those kinds of uh, businesses. So this should give you an idea of what you can do if you are able to take what, you, what these research point towards or enable and, and develop these kinds of innovations. So what does the future look like? The future is really going to be in the area of autonomous manufacturing. What do I mean by autonomous manufacturing? Now we talked about these digital twins and the digital model in the virtual world of everything. So you have to imagine a scenario now where in the future, if, if, you are, if, if, a, if somebody wants a product manufactured, they are able to design the product, but they're not able to manufacture it. Let's assume that. So they're able to design this product. They create a complete digital twin of this product. And the digital twin arrives at the factory uh, as a purchase order, let's say, in, in the form of a digital twin. Now, based on that, all the equipment in that factory can self-organize itself to produce this. Why is this possible? Because a lot of the manufacturer is going to be using technologies like additive manufacturing or 3D printing. And so a, a, a 3D printer can produce different kinds of parts. It just needs to be reconfigured and the rest of the systems need to be reconfigured. So the digital model comes in as a purchase order, the manufacturing systems uh, self-organize themselves to produce it. And then a logistic system delivers the product back to, the, uh, to her, whoever placed the order. And that is at a high level what autonomous manufacturing will look like. Now, what we are building today are the foundational pieces. And therefore, if you want to be an autonomous manufacturing company in the future, you have to have the ability, you have to have the foundational pieces like the industrial internet of thing platforms being installed, systems being connected, data being available, information flow at all levels and at all points being available. And that is where the future is headed. So a lot of things that I've heard from small and medium companies that I work with is, that hey, we do not have the money or the possibility to have our own R&D departments. How do we go about this? And one of the things I would encourage all of you to do is you do not need your own R&D departments. You have academia. Very often academia is doing research. And I know having been in the corporate world and now in the academia side, I know that a lot of that research is being done very often just to publish papers because that's what keeps professors and research people in, in academia going. But if we can channelize that, if industry can work with academia and collaborate and say, let's do research, which is going to enable innovations for me. And this is going to cost you one tenth of what you might if you invested in whole R&D departments. So I would encourage you to start looking at this model of collaborating with academia to develop research, which can then help you develop ideas for innovation. So I would say as, as a conclusion, that the winners in the future will be those who can combine and merge all these discrete research that's going on out there. Things that you may not be able to directly connect with what, what the future might bring. But if you're able to look at that, 
combine and merge those discrete research ideas and then innovate to disrupt. Those will be the winners, uh, in my opinion, in, for the future. And I hope those ideas are something that you can use, especially if you are startup companies and small innovation companies. But also I, I understand there's a lot of academia people on this, uh, on this uh, call and that they should also look into how can we work in more meaningful ways uh, to enable these innovations. So with that, I'm going to conclude uh, and say thank you very much for the opportunity. And uh, I don't know if there's a Q&A as part of this, Nea or Amit, but uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you very much, Professor Jagannath, for the profound session. With that, we would like to have, uh, I mean, we have opened for a couple of quick questions. So we have received certain questions from the audience. First one I would like to uh, put up is, uh, I mean, what would be the ideal way to bring research to mid-sized manufacturing companies? Which I think I addressed more towards the end of my presentation. And I, like I said, uh, research, does not come to you. Let me put that also straight. It, research does not come to your doorstep, uh, especially if you're not the one doing research. Research is happening in isolation, in pockets, in academia, and other parts of it. What you have to do is you have to be working together to explore what's going on. Uh, papers are being published. You can look at papers. You can see, is there a possibility of that being applied to what I'm doing? And then look at where is the research being done and how can I collaborate with these people? The key really boils down to how can I find the sources and collaborate with them? Because that's the only way this is going to happen. Otherwise, everybody is sitting at their point, hoping that something is going to happen. There is one more question. Uh, what are the challenges in implementing Industry 4.0 solutions for SMEs? Is this... Uh... So, the, and that's a great question because there are challenges. I mean, it's not... And the challenge really comes from, uh, if you look at the premise of Industry 4.0 that I described, that is availability of information and data at every point of the life cycle of that process. That basically means you need to have systems, your manufacturing systems connected. You need to be able to build in the level of automation, which is giving you the kind of data that you have. You need to be able to network and get the information that you want. Very often you have legacy systems in your manufacturing. How can I retrofit that and make them more connected using sensors, et cetera. So there's an element of creating that foundational piece, which I therefore call the industrial internet of things. Uh, that is a challenge. And one has to look at how can I create that foundational piece? And it can start in a very minimal way to make sure that you are getting used to that idea, you're comfortable with doing that uh, and not boil the ocean by trying to now say, I'm gonna make my whole uh, setup into some sort of a connected uh, world. Uh, but that is the steps you have to take. And the challenge really is in how you go about accomplishing that. Because once you do that, then you're positioning yourself to use all these technologies in a manner. Now, if you do not do that, then I'm afraid that you you don't you're not you're unable to play in that realm anymore. You know, right? So I think audience don't want uh, I mean don't want to let you go. And uh, here's one more question for you: When starting on digital journey, what should be the initial steps? So I mean I think it's a very similar question. I would say the initial steps is think about. Anything that you're doing, whether you're manufacturing, whether you're designing a product, any of those activities that you're doing, first thing that you have to keep in mind is that everything I do here, I have to way of, I have to have a way of getting information out of what I'm building and designing. So it goes back to the world of having connected systems. Now, connected system doesn't necessarily mean you just need a, uh, something in the real world. As I talked about digital twins, you can start at the design phase. How can I build in as I'm designing all these different aspects about getting data, transferring it into uh, the world that I can view and analyzing that and starting there. Start small. I would always say, do not make the mistake of starting on a digital journey in a, in a big uh, dramatic way. It is bound to lead to failure take small pieces of what you're doing and see how you can 
work with some of those technologies, experiment with some of those technologies before you start looking at the possibility of expanding. Uh, very often when I work with companies, we always encourage them to not go in and build a whole thing, but let's take a small part of what you're doing. Let's do kind of a proof of concept. Let's see if it works before we go into a bigger world. I would also caution you one more thing. Don't start on a digital journey just because everybody's starting on a digital journey. If what you're doing doesn't necessarily lend itself to going beyond a certain point in that journey, realize that and see how you can maximize with what you have. So it's not art for art's sake. So, I mean, uh, for MSMEs, is it affordable to start the digital transformation or, uh, I mean, adopting digitalization? Is it affordable for them? So, afford see, what is affordability? Affordability can also be, is most likely always measured with what is the return on investment, right? Uh, now, affordability is a matter of saying, if I do this, right, uh, it's not... If you want to do something and you believe that that's going to take you to a very next level, and that's what innovation is about, then you'd start on the journey. Now, affordability also, of course, usually the question is asked in the context of, how do I get the money for this, right? And I don't think in today's world, if you're a startup or if you're a company, which is thinking of innovation, which is thinking of taking something to the next level, that there are constraints of funding or, or constraints of uh, financial uh, kind of constraints. You don't have to be a big company with a lot of cloud. But what is important is that you're thinking clearly about what is that innovation that I'm thinking about? What, where can I take this business if this happens? What can it return to me? And affordability should always be measured from that perspective. You know? One last question. Uh, academia in India is not oriented towards research. So that is result oriented or makes commercial sense. How to bring that into the educational institutes? Well, I, I, I don't know if that's generically true that academia in, in India is not, uh, uh, because I mean, I know that universities in the US collaborate with universities in India. Uh, it may not be the story in every university, but you know, you, you can, you will, when in the US, for example, where I, at the University of Georgia, we always say, you have to decide what kind of university you want to be. Are you a research oriented university? Is that where you want to stake your claim and be known for? Or do you want to be the universities which is doing practical things, right? Uh, from my little interactions, for example, about IIT Gandhinagar is one of those places which I'm told the focus is more on practical stuff uh, rather than, you know, academic research. So you have to decide. Now, if you decide you want to be a research kind of university, then you have to, you have to build in all the required uh, curriculums, programs, the infrastructure to how that is taught, what you have access to, etc. There is no, there's no silver bullet to this. You have to be, yeah. but I think it starts with the process of, do I want to be a research kind of university? In which case there are, the long-term goal for me is I have to, I should be able to collaborate with, uh, with, uh, with industry because it enables two things. That's where my funding comes from, but that's where what I do as work gets used also. You know, I, I, I spent a few years in Germany and if and I think it's a great example in emulating the German universities, they have very clear cut research universities, which are deep in research. And the company I worked for Siemens would then go to those companies those kinds of universities when it was a research oriented topic. Then there were universities which would do very practical building stuff, robotics, et cetera, et cetera. And we would go then when it came to other areas of maybe product development, things like that. But you have to, you have to build it up. It's, it's, you cannot wait and say, how do I become a research university, right? I would uh, sincerely like to express my thanks to you, Professor, for fielding the questions from the audience so sportingly. Thank you very much, sir.